Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to upstate New York and talk with author and blogger James Howard Kunstler. James, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Hi, Max. Nice to be with you. Now, I believe uh, you have a phrase, uh, entropy made visible. What's that all about? You know, entropy is that force in uh, nature uh, that drives us towards uh, disorder and death and destruction. It's the second law of thermodynamics. And, uh, you know, what it basically means is that things run down. You know, your coffee cup never warms f up more. It always just cools off. You know, people don't go uh, in the direction of being younger. They go in the direction of being older and passing away. You know, things don't get better when you use them, they break down. All right, I guess this would also kind of play into what we're seeing globally with the uh, Fukushima power plant destruction. There's been a collapse in this just-in-time supply chain inventory methodology, which when you take, one, you take away one piece and entropy ensues and things suddenly get ugly. Would you, does, that, does that fit in? Yes, I, I think, you know, entropy is the, the, really the 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 reason why things break down in the world but I, I have a special pet theory about japan these days i think they're going to be going medieval i think they're going to at some point uh... in the year or two ahead they're going to decide you know we've we've had the industrial adventure and we just can't do it anymore because we have to import over ninety five percent of our hydrocarbon uh... fuels and energy and we we really aren't going to be able to do that so uh, let's go back to uh, the 18th century. I think that's going to happen over there. I know it's kind of an out-of-the-box idea, but there you have it. Well, it's an interesting thought. I, we've talked about on this show a lot about what we call neo-feudalism, where you've got modern societies breaking down and you've got the emergence of a kleptocracy who are pulling up the drawbridge. You know, all the assets are inside the, the kleptocracy and everyone else is left outside of the, in, in the wilderness. So applied to Japan as a whole, is there enough of a vestige of society there to pick up on it? I know I don't, I'm not an expert on Japanese culture, but it seems like they have clung to many of their medieval traditions. Is there, just again, thinking out of the box, is there enough of a, a vestige there to, to build out? Could they conceivably go this, in this direction, James Howard Kunstler? Well, I, I don't think we really know. They do have a, a very deep and fine culture. Um, and it was kind of blasted away by this 200-year uh, adventure, less than 200-year adventure in industrialism. And I I'm not really sure that they have any choice anymore. You know, one of the things, uh, speaking of feudalism, that I do believe we're going to see is there are going to be a lot of desperate people in the industrial nations who, uh, you know, really can't feed their families or can't make as much money as they did before or are in some way or other finding themselves in desperate trouble. And I think what we will see is that they will sell their allegiance to some authority or person or group, uh, you know, in order to have uh, uh, security for food, shelter, and the basic necessities for life. And, and that's the essence of feudalism, when you're selling your allegiance to somebody for security. Sure. I remember I used to live in, a, in the south of France in a town called villefranche sur mer and this town got started something like 800 years ago by uh, a local uh, pirate arriving and, and selling people security, saying, let me pay a stipend to me every year, and I'll protect you from uh, any forces that come about. So you, you see a return to this type of model, where, uh, but broken down uh, locally. So instead of, let's say, the U.S. being the world's global protectorate and extracting stipends from the world, you know, the world has to pay its annual tribute to America in one form or another to keep them safe, as the U.S. collapses, the model is uh, broken down and we see more of a medieval model uh, emerge. But let me ask you this about Japan for a second. The atomic energy industry, the plants in Japan, they're used to essentially boil water. Uh, that's, what, that's what that whole uh, atomic energy configuration is all about. Yeah, to run turbines. Right. Now, Japan like Iceland, is sitting on huge geothermal resources. I read somewhere recently that the geothermal resources could do everything, supply as much power as the atomic energy industry can. Is it, have you heard about this? Is that true? Is it practical? What are your thoughts on that? There's no question that uh, Japan is located on the Ring of Fire uh, in their part of the Pacific, and there's a lot of volcanic 
activity and a lot of earthquake activity. You know, one, one thing that a lot of people don't understand about that kind of energy is that you can actually run it down in a local sweet spot. And uh, we also don't know what happens when you sink a lot of pipe into these uh, uh, fractures and, and uh, uh, you know, places where the, the crust of the earth is disturbed. And, you know, it, it may be that you can actually disturb it more by doing it. Okay, you mentioned sticking pipes into the ground and not having a great idea how that, how that all works. Now, to stop radiation from leaking uh, from the Fukushima plant into the sea, TEPCO has deployed a few kilos of diaper absorbent. Now, it uh, reminds me of the golf balls thrown into the deep water horizon well during that catastrophe, that BP catastrophe. What, what are your thoughts on these, again, returning to medievalism, on these primitive methods of responding to these high-tech catastrophes? People, well, people seem to do what they can, you know. They, when people are desperate, they'll do strange and desperate things. So uh, it's not surprising, you know. They, they just can't, you know, sop up that radioactive liquid or keep it from going into the sea or getting into the ground. So, uh, you know, they're doing what they can. Are they throwing depends in there? Yeah, they're throwing diapers and uh, garbage and whatever they can get their hands on, like yeah. they did, you know, the, the famous junk shot of the deep water drill. So here, it's very asymmetric in this way. They come up with these high-tech, brilliant, multi-quadrillion dollar schemes to do deep water drilling or have an atomic energy plan on the ring of fire, but nobody, or invade Iraq for that matter, but there's no contingency plan. If anything goes wrong, everyone's got their thumb up their shwing shwing, and they're saying, well, I, we never thought anything could possibly go wrong. Let's throw some garbage at it. I mean, what is the mentality that where, where these politicians and engineers and everyone associated with this can't seem to ever imagine that anything they ever do fails? The human race is kind of a comical species, and, uh, you know, sometimes things don't work out for us. We, we like to think magically that everything is going to work just fine. Uh, did you happen to see Mr. Obama's energy speech this week? Give me the highlights. Uh, another example of uh, our absolute inability to tell the truth to ourselves. You know, we just are just stuck in incredible magical thinking that, you know, that, that there are huge undiscovered uh, unexplored areas of North America that we're going to get huge amounts of uh, oil out of. It's complete nonsense. Um, and by the way, Larry Kudlow got on TV last week and said we have a hundred years worth of shale, shale gas and, uh, excuse me, 300 years of shale gas, and President Obama said we have 100 years of shale gas, and both of those statements are completely untrue. We have probably about four to six years worth of uh, shale gas energy at the rate that we use it, and maybe 12 years if you include all of the natural gas of any kind that we drill in North America. You know, we have these crazy ideas that we're going to run uh, an electric car fleet. Well, here's an interesting thing. Let's say uh, by some miracle we ramped up an, uh, an electric car fleet of, a hun uh, of 10 million electric cars in the USA, and that's really optimistic. Um, we run over 200 million cars, okay? So what do you think is going to be the political upshot if only 10 million people get to drive and, and all the rest of them are paying through the nose for gasoline or can't even afford to own a car? Do you think there will be any political repercussions of that? Because I do. Well, uh, these are the kinds of things we're not even thinking about. Well, Barack Obama is uh, proving himself to be the Charlie Sheen of presidents. Uh, he's, great <laughs> on, he's, he's great on Twitter. He's got a great Twitter following. But when it comes to delivering, he's a catastrophe. All right. So uh, you were uh, recently quoted as saying uh, that you believe that industrial farming will soon end. Okay. Talk about this a little bit. By industrial farming, I mean what we take to be the normal way of farming in America, which is, you know, huge acreages with giant machines, a lot of diesel fuel, a lot of uh, hydrocarbon-based uh, soil amendments, herbicides, pesticides, uh, fertilizers. Uh, you know, we're going to get to a point where we're, we're going to have trouble carrying that on. And, you know, there's another part of uh, the industrial farming picture that we don't think about at all. There's another main uh, uh, thing that we use, and that's capital. You know, it takes a lot of borrowed money to run a big corn operation in the Midwest. And we're running out of capital. And the reason we're running out of capital is because there's a huge amount of borrowed money out there, or credit, or debt, that isn't being paid back. And as that money 
is not paid back, it, the money vanishes from the system. And there's less and less money out there for people to, uh, you know, borrow to run their farms or even to do other things like buy cars or buy houses on 30-year mortgages. So we're facing a tremendous uh, capital shortage that's every bit as severe as our energy problem. And, uh, you know, I don't, really don't think we understand how it fits into the picture. All right, we've got about a minute left. I want to talk about this a little bit more because it's very confusing for a lot of people because what you're describing is deflation. What you're, what you're describing is what happens when credit evaporates, when, when the ability to roll credit over uh, evaporates and the credit simply disappears and you have deflation, which is what's happening in the real estate market, which is what's driving Barack Obama, I'm sorry, Ben Bernanke to continue his quantitative easing uh, and his quantitative easing one, two, three, and four, but no matter how much of this credit he expands, it doesn't seem to be enough to cover the black hole of debt that's emerging, and the net result is deflation, but at the same time, you have rising energy and precious metals prices, which people point to and say, aha, that's inflation, and the disconnect comes between having a system that's run on a gold standard where you could have inflation against something like gold and a system that's purely fiat money based where you have no collateral whatsoever at the underlying this in this economy. So we end up with what I think you would describe. I know, you just, you know you've you described peak oil and now you're talking about peak credit. And these two things are coterminous, correct? That's kind of the point. Is it not James Howard Kunstler? Yeah. And, and I think there are two things that are going on right now with uh, with the debt situation. One is that we've used so many accounting tricks to hide the losses and hide the fact that the certificates in the vaults of the Federal Reserve and the big banks uh, are worthless, that we can't even determine what debt is not being paid back. You know, it's just not being uh, recorded. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, as a general principle, when you introduce uh, distortions into a system, you end up perver uh, uh, producing perverse behavior in that system. So right now, you know, the perverse behavior is that the deflation just isn't being allowed to show up. And, you know, we're seeing these distortions, like distortions in commodity prices and, and, and things like that. But, you know, as this works out, I think that we're going to see a whole lot more deflation. And what that really boils down to is that nobody has any money when you have deflation. If you get into a, a hyperinflation event, which tends to be a very sudden kind of event that happens very quickly because people start spending money as fast as they get it, uh, you know, that, that's having a lot of money that isn't worth anything. So you can have a lot of money that's worthless or you can have no money, but either way you're broke. Okay, James Howard Kunstler, thanks so much again for being on the Kaiser Report. It's nice to be here by remote control. Fantastic. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, James Howard Kunstler. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.